Batman vs. Superman made a shit ton of money. It must be good, right? Your subtlety. I know I called how this movie might fail, but deep down, I wanted it to win. How cool would it have been if DC finally got a franchise going? No matter what you say, Marvel is doing it right. So my review is going to be a little bit different. A lot of people have already reviewed Batman vs. Superman. So I'm going to compare Marvel and DC with their newest movies. It's going to be Batman vs. Superman vs. Civil War. I'm going to address the elephant in the room. The Marvel Defense. It comes in various forms. They're totally different companies. You can't compare Marvel to DC. Oh, you're just biased. Let me explain why you are very, very incorrect. I assume you're a human being, so you've eaten the best food on the planet. Fried chicken! You go to different restaurants and eat their fried chicken. After eating, you can then say, Oh, I think Chicken X is yummy. Chicken Y is kind of shit. And Chicken Z is not as yummy as Chicken X, but it's getting there. You could do that with any product you buy. Different companies having different approaches to the same product does not mean they are not competing. Oh, what? Did you think Warner Brothers moved the release date because they're not competing? Obviously not. Obviously, they're different movies. Obviously. Get away! Get back! Before I go on, somebody actually complained that I spoiled Seven, a movie that came out in 1995. So if you don't mind getting spoiled, or you do mind, this is just a heads up. How old are you? Number one, who is running the boat? Kevin Feige is the architect of Marvel Studios. His vision has led the company forward ever since Iron Man. Meanwhile, DC has Zack Snyder, who seems to take the helm after Man of Steel. You could see where these movies are going based on the vision of these guys for the whole franchise. So how do they approach the property? Feige wanted to remain authentic to these characters. It makes sense since he values the audience that made the product possible in the first place. Comic book nerds. If you piss off the comic book fans, how will anyone else like the movie? Rest assured that I was on the internet within minutes registering my disgust throughout the world. Movie executives wanted half of the first Captain America to take place in present day, as opposed to the six-minute escapade that we see when he wakes up. Guess who stopped them? Feige! The origin of, of Steve Rogers, of Captain America, is inherently in World War II. So we decided we're going to make a 1940s adventure superhero movie. You know, in hindsight, it, it, was a, it was a great decision, but at the time, it was controversial internally. The surreal, whimsical coffee scene in Thor? Feige! This drink, I like it. I know, it's great, right? Another! The idea that you could have a franchise starring a talking raccoon and a sentient tree? Feige. We were in six, seven, eight years ago when we decided, hey, we want to make a feature out of Iron Man. Guardians has been around for years. Hardcore fans know them well from the comic. But really, we're looking at something new. I could go on and on, but you get the idea. I don't know if Feige does it himself, but Marvel knows how to pick a director for a particular adaptation. I love the period, I love the designs and the clothes and the technology and everything. And I wanted to prove that you could make a period action film, have it be as exciting as a contemporary one. What I did find exciting was seeing the formative moments in this origin story of a Loki who could then fire off into other Marvel movies with the audience knowing from whence the potential for evil came. Driving force for me was to be able to create a gritty world that was still very colorful. How about Zack Snyder? His approach is simple. Make everything dark and gritty and violent. That worked for his first adaptation, 300. There was really nothing light or whimsical about that particular comic. His style of movie making fit the material he was adapting, so he got lucky. I'm not saying that a dark and gritty approach to movies does not work. It all depends on what you are adapting. You shouldn't forget the source material, especially when it calls for nuance and complexity. Zack Snyder has a habit of focusing on the spectacle, not substance. 
You could see it in Watchmen. There's the character's newfound cinematic love of violence. While breaking Rorschach out of prison, there's literally a single panel of them casually punching inmates, and they're having an intense conversation at the same time. Where in the film, they work their way up a corridor of enemies just killing and slashing and Punching. Snyder basically gave all the characters superpowers. More story is that Dr. Manhattan is the only superpowered one in the lot, and none of the other would-be Watchmen really know how to deal with him anymore. One of Moore's big points in the book was looking under the costumes of his heroes and seeing all their weaknesses. Night Owl's fear for the future, Silk Spectre's frustration with the way her life has gone, Warshak's massive psychological damage, they're just ordinary people who've taken the extraordinary steps of putting on costumes and fighting crime. After waiting 20 plus years for a film adaptation, this became a lot of people's biggest problem with the film, because it's easy to make superhero characters who casually take the little people apart with their bare hands. What's hard is making those characters totally, pathetically, openly human. And Snyder avoided that. I'm not going into detail about how Man of Steel failed as an adaptation for Superman, since I already did that. You might want to click that link if you want. I can wait. Let's hear what Zack Snyder thinks of superhero costumes. And so you have these kind of, uh, I, I kind of came to the conclusion also that they couldn't really talk in their suits um, with any credibility. You know what I mean? Really? Really? You never think for one second, shit, I just killed a human being. It's being pretty generous. A human being who did a lot of stupid shit, maybe even evil, but had one small piece of goodness in him. Maybe just a scrap, Frank, but something. And then you come along and that one tiny flicker of light gets snuffed out forever. You, we, 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 we had to get them back in their civvies. So you couldn't have that version of the heat coffee, coffee uh, shops. You can't in, you in couldn't. their suits. I think you're wrong. Which part? All of it. I think there's no good in the field that I put down. That's what I think. And how do you know? I just know. Look around, man. This city, it stinks. It's a sewer. It stinks and it smells like shit. And I can't get the stink out of my nose. I think that this world, it needs men that are willing to make the hard call. That's what I think. I think you and me are the same. same. You know it. Only I do the one thing that you can't. You hit them and they get back up. I hit them and they stay down. It's permanent. The honest truth is we talked all about, like, we need the heat scene. Like, that was, like, my mantra I kept saying. We need the heat scene. We need the heat scene. Don't let yourself get attached to anything you are not willing to walk out on in 30 seconds flat if you feel the heat around a corner. Now, if you're around me and you got to move when I move, how do you expect to keep a, a marriage? Well, that's an interesting point. What are you, a monk? I have a woman. What do you tell her? I tell her I'm a salesman. So then if you spot me coming around that corner, you're just gonna walk out on this woman? That's the discipline. That's pretty vacant, you know? Yeah, it is what it is. It's that or we both better go do something else, pal. I don't know how to do anything else. Neither do I. I don't much want to either. Neither do I. Yeah. But like when they're in their suits, it was impossible. We, tr we tried it. And, and <laughs> okay. it's just one of those things that you really... Those mob fools want you gone so they can get back to the way things were. But I know the truth. There's no going back. You've changed things. Why do you want to kill me? <laughs> I don't, don't want to kill you. What would I do without you? Well, you, you complete me you're garbage who kills for money don't talk like one of them you're not even if you'd like to be to them you're just a freak like me they need you right now but when they don't they'll cast you out you 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 know if they're like more than four or five lines and you start to notice like wait these are two guys dressed up one guy's dressed up like a bat and the other one has a big red s on his chest and they're being <laughs> super serious about how mad they are at each other next time they shine your light in the sky don't go to it the bat is dead bury it consider this mercy tell me do you plead you will and it just you, you can you know it's just a, it's a dangerous thing you know because uh, okay it just gets yeah looks good right but there's common Zack Snyder defenses. It's a serious movie. A serious movie does not mean it's a good movie. 
especially if you make a two-hour humorless film. You need the light moments to make the dark moments matter, and vice versa. A light moment with the main characters can have use if it sets up a dramatic moment. <laughs> yeah, all right, laugh it up. <laughs> she begged for her life to take it. Shut up! She begged for her life. Shut up! And for the life of the baby inside of her. Shut up! He didn't know. Batman and Superman are too serious to their detriment. They are grim exaggerations of who they are as characters, which is related to the next defense. The film is realistic. It's, it's not. It's not realistic. No, no. Fuck, fuck that shit. The consequences are realistic, but these characters are not. A good movie is not made by the explosions the invulnerable man makes when he passes through a gas station. It's made by an interesting protagonist that the audience can root for. People are nuanced and complex. They have more than one expression. Other than, ah, I'm mad, uh, I'm serious, look at my face. And the final defense is religious imagery. I'll kill him. Well, he'll be a god to them. There's a chance I can save Earth by turning myself in. Shouldn't I take it? Boss, you can save her, Cal. You can save all of them. Okay, he's the Messiah. I get it. People point out religious imagery so that it appears that Zack Snyder's movie means something, when in fact it does not. Good imagery is like a spiral. You know what it is, but each spin reveals something new about the thing. So, if he's a god, you should showcase another aspect of being a god, like the burden of saving someone, or the power you wield, or something else about being a god. And, you know, a good Superman movie doesn't really need that imagery. You could just show us that he's a good guy. I'm here to fight for truth and justice in the American way. The imagery in Man of Steel is like a straight line. You showcase he's the messiah, he's godlike, and that's it. What's worse is that the imagery is utterly pointless because he is not a savior. Superman saves people in the movie, but when it counts, he does not give a fuck. He just decides to battle in Metropolis putting all the lives of these people in danger. Are you effing stupid? I think that Zack Snyder doesn't get it, that Superman just allowing all this is a bad thing. I think I want to talk about the big death that everyone's going to be talking about. Jimmy Olsen. The death of innocence? <laughs> the oh, death of innocence. <laughs> <laughs> if the imagery is used to show that Superman is a savior, but all he does is cause destruction, which leads to the death of millions of civilians, what's the point? I'm not being sarcastic here, this is a serious question. This just goes to show that Snyder likes the spectacle. But if you ask him the meaning behind it, he'll probably just say, it looks cool. I guess it's okay, since... I just think he's kinda hot. Two, conflict you could root for. A good film thrives on interesting conflict. Or, if the conflict is generic, how well you tell it. So how is the conflict between these two movies? One thing I find interesting about these movies is that the conflict is about these two guys. But in fact, there's someone else behind the scenes. Civil War is essentially Iron Man and Friends versus Captain America and Friends. Civil War asks, should the superheroes be policed? Iron Man says yes, Captain America says no. One of the advantages of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is that there are so many movies in the library. You could see where Iron Man is coming from if you watched previous movies. And the same goes for Cap. 
Iron Man Zero Fuck's given approach to superheroing has led to catastrophic results. I'm sorry, I know you mean well. You just didn't think it through. And as we saw in Iron Man, he wanted to make up for Stark Industries weapons being sold to terrorists. I saw young Americans killed by the very weapons I created to defend them and protect them. That I had become part of a system that is comfortable with zero accountability. Effective immediately, I am shutting down the weapons manufacturer division of Stark International. So character-wise, we see that need for Iron Man to redeem himself. Meanwhile, Cap's experience with big wigs meddling into things has led to disaster. He knows that any organization can be used for some other agenda. Hydra's secret weapon. Is there anything you can tell us about the Tesseract that we ought to know now? You should have left it in the ocean. Phase two is S.H.I.E.L.D. uses the cube to make weapons. I was wrong, Director. The world hasn't changed a bit. This is Project Insight. Three next generation helicarriers synced to a network of targeting satellites. These new long range precision guns can eliminate a thousand hostiles a minute. By holding a gun to everyone on Earth and calling it protection. This isn't freedom, this is fear. Both of these characters have good reasons for their argument. In turn, the audience will also have a good reason to pick a side. Tony Stark, Iron Man's uh, side, yeah. just makes so much more sense in every conceivable way. <laughs> no, you're talking about you're talking about people with insane superpowers taking the law into their own hands and doing whatever they want. Like, why didn't why it's didn't? It's an argument. I'm, I think I lean more towards the Captain America side. The non-valid point is the Tony Stark side, where it's like, okay, the uh, the UN will vote that you go fight this this super monster. You're still gonna have collateral damage. In Batman vs. Superman, Batman dislikes Superman for destroying Metropolis. Even though, as we see in the movie, a quick Google search will yield that Superman has actually saved people. At the very least, it seems that he's trying to make up for what he did. Superman dislikes Batman's vigilante approach, despite doing this in the end of Man of Steel. I'm here to help. But it has to be on my own terms. The conflict does not make sense. You cannot root for either of them. Batman can't take the moral high ground since he's casually killing people. Superman can't pretend to be the paladin here. Remember the terrorist that was holding Lois hostage? The human being that he smashed through the wall? Yeah, he, he'll be fine, don't worry. So which murderer will the audience root for? The vigilante who kills criminals indiscriminately? Or the vigilante that causes massive destruction, causing massive death indiscriminately? I said earlier that there are people pulling the strings. In the case of Civil War, we have Zemo. It appears he's a dick. He gets a call from his wife, telling him how much they love him, his son misses him. Then he turns off the phone! What a dick! He frames Bucky so that Bucky can be captured, which turns out to be a bigger plot. There are these five super soldiers, the same as Bucky. So it appears that Zemo wants these soldiers for himself. At the end of the movie, having manipulated events, he leads Captain America, Bucky, and Iron Man into the lair where the soldiers were. But the soldiers who are supposed to topple empires was killed. He then shows a video to Iron Man. And it reveals that Bucky killed Iron Man's parents. Zemo wants the Avengers to be destroyed. And his motivation can be understood. It was foreshadowed in the movie when the Black Lady got mad at Iron Man for causing the destruction at Sokovia, which leads to the death of her son. It's the same here. When Sokovia crashed, it destroyed Zemo's family. And that phone call he received was all he had of them. That's his motivation. You understand where he's coming from and why he wants to kill Iron Man and Captain America. In Batman vs Superman, we have Lex Luthor. We know that he wants to kill Superman, but why? After Jesse Eisenberg's uh, performance as Lex Luthor, I think alcohol is required. <laughs> <laughs> he's the only character I think I liked. Like, he was... But, but why weird. did you like him? He was like so weird, like... <laughs> <laughs> you do not want to fight this guy! <laughs> Why Ass does he burgery. want to kill Superman? 
Mr. Bibb says Lex Luthor hates Superman because he is all good and all powerful, which Lex can't stand. Where do you get that? Where does he say that? What in the movie informs this? That's that's the real question. Because Luther is convinced that he's the angel. He talks about the demons coming from uh, above, not right. below. He doesn't see himself as being all bad. The buildup and the motivation of Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor creating Doomsday, I get why he made him. Sure. He hates, he essentially hates God. Yeah. And Superman is the closest representation of God and he wants to destroy that, maybe for some self-accreditation or maybe he wants to prove that he's better. Yeah, he has lots of like, like diatribes about gods and yeah, their relation right, right, with right. him and this stuff. But, so I guess it's just related to that, but it's all really, really vague and it's just, it's just there to set up a giant orc monster at the end of the movie for everyone to fight. Why is he creating a monster? I, I don't know. We, well, he's got to kill Superman. Even though is that why he's creating a monster? Even though his plan was apparently to get Batman to kill Superman. Right. So he's got to have a monster just in case Batman fails to kill Superman, then the monster can do it. But I guess, I guess if Batman does successfully kill Superman, which is his initial plan, then what do you do with the rampaging monster you just created that has nothing to counter it? We don't know. We 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 don't we. Three characters that are consistent. Civil War is the 13th film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You've got a whole cast of characters you've seen in different movies. The straight-laced Captain America, the billionaire genius philanthropist, red-headed hotties, or the black sidekick. There's someone here for everyone. Not only that, the characterization has been consistent. Cap is a goody two-shoes above all else. While he respects authority, if he has to do something right, he'll do it. Iron Man has a guilt complex, that's why he wants to be a hero, to redeem himself. So when you hear Tony say, We need to be put in check. Whatever form that takes, I'm game. And Steve reacts with, I know we're not perfect, but the safest hands are still our own. You can say, oh, that's consistent. They've done that for the past movies. I get it. Is the consistency perfect? No. Iron Man has consistently ignored his team and does whatever the fuck he wants. And Cap has consistently reminded him that they need to work together. In Batman vs Superman, you've got characters that are thoroughly inconsistent in their characterization in that one movie. Batman is smart and a good detective when they want him to be. Superman is godlike when they want him to be. I'd like to take a moment point out the inconsistent characterization began in Man of Steel. Someone pointed out in the YouTube comments that Superman couldn't have stopped Zod. Oh no, if only we established earlier that Superman can carry Zod around like a little bitch. And Man of Steel goes on to show that he saves people. So we have this. Therefore, you the man now, dog. Reasonable conclusion, right? But at the most important part, the remnants of Metropolis is destroyed. People are still there. The people that Superman supposedly gives a shit about. What does Superman decide to do? He decides to fight in the city? You ruined my formula, bro! This is the part where Superman should have said, Zod. Let's take this somewhere else. And then Zod goes, You can't tell me what to do, boy. And Superman goes, I'm not telling you. And then he grabs him and they go somewhere else. In the middle of the ocean, in the desert, somewhere. Will Zod kill people while Superman's dragging him away? Probably, yes. But will Superman be a hero? Will this show Superman caring about people? Yes. And you know what the weirdest thing is? He suddenly remembers that he could carry Zod around. And he drags him into this train station. Why? Oh, oh yeah, it's because Zod can now attempt to kill these people. And Superman has to cry now because he really cares about human life. If he really cared about these people, maybe, just maybe, you shouldn't have fought in Metropolis. When you write characters that are inconsistent, that leads to a bigger problem because they can just forget things and remember to do them at the convenience of the storyteller. And to me, that translates as shitty, shitty writing.
I'm not opposed to the idea of killing Zod. It's been done before. But you gotta ask yourself. They set up the scenario of Superman giving a shit. And then he doesn't. He saves the world by destroying the engine, sure. So why does he forget that at this most important moment? Was this the right way to have done it? I wanna know why you have the Man of Steel Superman killing General Zod even though he's known for never killing and never harming anybody beyond what he needs to get them to stop. Well, what's funny about that rule is it exists in the movies, but it doesn't really exist in the comic books. I mean, he's oh. killed Zod a couple times in the right. comic books. When we were making the movie, I didn't really clock it. I was like, well, of course he's got to kill me. You know, I'm out of control. I think that it's a notion that it has grown out of the way he's been popularized on TV and in the movies more than the sort of comic book mythology of Superman, which is he's a much more practical uh, hero. Killing General Zod is a practical solution to the problem. He wouldn't let his personal sort of aversion to killing cost him the lives of an entire planet. Or even that little kid that- Or those little kids, with, yeah, yeah. That, that little family. Yeah, yeah. So like if he had said like, well, I just, I'm morally opposed to killing, so I guess I have to let him kill those people. Yeah, yeah that's, those, those are the dilemmas. And then we set that up directly so that there would be no solution other than that solution. This problem continues in Batman vs. Superman. Remember how Batman can be sneaky and investigative? The scenes where he infiltrated the underworld were pretty great. Now, how about the scene where Lex Luthor blows up Congress using Bruce's former employee? Here is the scenario. You're Bruce Wayne, you have a meeting, suddenly the TV opens, and you see that for a congressional hearing calling out Superman's bullshit, you see your former employee suited up in a brand new wheelchair. The movie is logical at this point. He goes, why is he there? How about the checks we're sending him? It turns out that these checks were being sent back to Bruce Wayne with red ink stating you failed your family. The question is, why would Bruce get mad? Wouldn't his detective senses go, hmm, let me think about this. My old employees on Congress suited up with a new wheelchair. Why does he look like that? He's been sending these checks back to me. He'd be poor as fuck. That doesn't make any sense. Something's up. Who set them up with this? Lex? Lex Luthor is going to attend the congressional hearing? The guy who has the kryptonite? The thing I need to kill Superman? Hmm. On Superman's end, how about when Lex takes Martha hostage? Superman panics and he asks Lex where she is. But earlier, when Lois was falling down a 500-story building, Superman came from nowhere and saved her. How come Superman can't use his super detecting skills to find his mom? The thing he did in the beginning of the movie, when Lois was surrounded by terrorists, and minutes before Lex put his ultimatum to Superman. Oh. There is seriously no reason for Superman not to try to find his mother. Let me walk you through it. Last time we saw Superman, he was moping with Ghost Dad in the Fortress of Solitude. If you remember, in Man of Steel, the fortress was actually the ship which the government took and gave to Lex Luthor at this point in the movie. So maybe he goes back to where it was for nostalgia purposes. It makes sense since he hallucinates his father when he gets back there. The Fortress of Solitude can be found in Ellesmere Island. The reference point I used to get to Ellesmere Island is New York City since the internet told me that New York is near Metropolis. There is no straight route to get to Ellesmere Island from New York. So for the sake of argument, let's just compute the distance from the island to New York. That's 2,769 miles. Since Metropolis is south from New York, let's say that the distance from Ellesmere Island to Metropolis is 2,850 miles. The average speed of a commercial airliner would be 500 knots or 546 to 575 miles per hour. Let's get the fastest speed and use that to compute the time it would take to travel from Ellesmere Island to Metropolis. That would be 4.956 or 5 hours. 
How long did it take Superman to travel from Ellesmere Island to Metropolis? Two minutes? Three minutes? Even less than that, I think. Fuck! So you expect me to believe that Superman, given how fast he is, can't take the time to find his mother, Behold, kill every one of those hostage takers, and then find Lex's helicopter and blow it the fuck out? <coughs> he can find his mom in the blink of an eye! If he knew the precise location of Lois while he was in the North Pole, he can certainly find his mom. There is only one reason for making Superman go along with this bullshit. And for Batman becoming a stupid fuck all of a sudden. The movie needed the fight. You know, this one in the title. They needed the fight in Civil War too, but at least they handled it more intelligently. These are the things the characters can do. The writers gave them that, and they worked with what they have. In the other film, the writers gave them these powers, these abilities, and when it counts, they took it away from them. And these are not minor mistakes. These mistakes set up the final fight. If Superman remembered that he had the power to find his mother faster than you can say, fuck this garbage movie, then he wouldn't have to fight Batman. If Batman took the time to breathe and realize how improbable it was for his employee who has no resources to get to Congress without any outside support, then he wouldn't have been motivated enough to steal the kryptonite and call Superman out. And why would Batman be mad at Superman when even the news reports say that the explosion was caused by the bomb in your employee's wheelchair? That has, it's a goddamn setup written all over it. Why are you stupid? You've shown us you're smart. Why are you stupid? Number four, sting me. What is a stinger? Like its namesake, it's at the end of the film. It's a shot done for fun. You're still here? It's over. Go home or to set up a sequel. But I can tell you one thing and it's a bit of a secret. The sequel, we're gonna have cable. If you're going to set up a sequel starting from a new narrative thread, it makes sense to do it at the end of the film. Everything is over, you could start a new plot. And Marvel has become known for doing these sorts of things in their movies. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger initiative. Well, I guess that's worth a look. DC did the thing. I would call it how not to do a teaser. That would have been a neat setup, but then it was a dream. Well, you said clever hints at movies to come. This movie has hints of movies to come, but there's nothing clever about any of it. And there won't be any movies to come. <laughs> <laughs> there was this whole sequence in the middle of the movie with Batman in the desert wearing a cool trench coat fighting Superman and his army. And it does nothing. It's a stupid teaser in the middle of the movie since it ruins the flow of the story. Imagine this. You are watching your favorite TV sitcom. Or at least it was until they turned everything to shit. But that is another tale for another time, children. The plot goes along in this particular episode. And the protagonist suddenly sits down, watches TV. There's a good length of time devoted to him just watching the channel. It shows cool things happening, but it does nothing to the plot. And then he turns off the TV and the show goes on like nothing happened. That is what they did. Batman looks cool. Superman looks cool, but it is utterly pointless since it adds nothing to the story. They should have put it in the end of the movie. Wonder why they didn't do it. Mm. Nope, I don't know. I don't know why they didn't do it. Oh, but it's a dream sequence. I hear you defend it. If it is a dream sequence, it has to have a consequence in the film you're watching. Flash appears at the end of the dream saying that Lois is the key to all of this. It's useless since Lois is never important in this movie. In fact, she does something stupid at the end of the film. Uh, Lois Lane, for no reason, takes the staff, the kryptonite staff, and yep. she throws it in some water. And then Batman says, in an unrelated scene in a completely different area, I need that staff back. Yes. And then they cut to Lois Lane and she goes back to get the staff that she just threw in the water. She just knows that they need the staff back? Yes. So she has to immediately go back and get the staff that she just threw in the water that she doesn't know.
And if it's a warning, it doesn't make sense. She's never in danger because Superman keeps saving her. Do we have to go through this all over again? Fuck. If George Lucas knew that in Revenge of the Sith and you did not, you fucked up. I can do a better stinger than Batman vs. Superman. There are movies that change you. There are movies that make you think. There are movies that change the way you look at the world. These two movies are not those fucking movies. The difference is one of them knows it and the other one does not. The whole conversation is re between revenge and justice. You know, what is the difference? You know, and the, there is a difference. The bat is dead. Bury it. Do you plead? Zach and Chris put together some really interesting ideas of Metropolis being a big successful city and Gotham City being um, a place where a lot more downtrodden people live. And there's you no know, wealth and power and the way power engenders fear. And there were a lot of really ideas that were a little bit too smart for me to understand, but that the movie was trafficking in and that I thought made it feel uh, real to me and, and smart and smart and smart. Batman versus Superman is the equivalent of that guy in Facebook. You know that guy, the guy that keeps saying he's a fucking badass. And the most badass thing he's ever done is to tell the barista that he put in Splenda when he asks for brown sugar. You're the man now, dog. Civil War has faults. I will list them now. Zemo's plan has too many moving parts. What if Bucky got killed? What if Captain America got killed? What if Iron Man got killed? His revenge would be fucking useless. How the fuck did Ant-Man get in the van? How did Hawkeye get in the thing? Wait for the short film explaining this shit in Netflix. What if Iron Man never saw the news footage about Bucky? He would never have believed Captain America and he would never have gone to Russia. Leaving Zemo to wonder, where the fuck is Iron Man? My vengeance is not complete. Civil War actually could have used the death. I think War Machine dying would have given the story more weight. But do you know why I gave it a pass? This is a comic book movie. And it embraces that genre. The beats are there. Good action. Good dramatic moments. Great character interaction. I'm not saying that this film cannot ask the hard questions. It can. Tony, if someone dies on your watch, you don't give up. Who said we're giving up? We are for not taking responsibility for our actions. Steve, that, that is dangerously arrogant. This is the United Nations we're talking about. It's not the World Security Council. It's not S.H.I.E.L.D. It's not Hydra. No, but it's run by people with agendas, and agendas change. That's good. That's why I'm here. When I realized what my weapons were capable of in the wrong hands, I shut it down, stopped manufacturing. Tony, you chose to do that. If we sign this, we surrender our right to choose. What if this panel sends us somewhere we don't think we should go? What if there's somewhere we need to go and they don't let us? We may not be perfect, but the safest hands are still our own. If we don't do this now, it's gonna be done to us later. I'm not saying that this film can't move you. It can. I'm sorry, Tommy. You know I wouldn't do this if I had any other choice. But he's my friend. So was I. But at least it doesn't pretend to be a transcendental experience. When addressing Steven Spielberg's recent comments regarding the impending death of superhero movies, Snyder explained why he believes the DC Comics properties may be immune to such a downfall. I feel like he's right, but I feel like Batman and Superman are transcendent of superhero movies in a way because they're Batman and Superman. The director then tossed Marvel's recent superhero film, Ant-Man, under the bus and added, they're not just like the flavor of the week Ant-Man, not to be mean, but whatever it is. What is the next blank man? What is the next blank man? What is the next blank man? Oh, we're too good for that. Oh, oh we have themes. If you say that you are smart, if you say that you are dabbling with philosophical themes, at the bare minimum, it should follow its own rules, shouldn't it? The plot has to make sense. Doesn't it? You know, we just talked about like what, how do you make this make sense? Before I demolish the story once and for all, there's this idea that the ultimate edition is better than the theatrical cut. I disagree. Whatever cut of the film it is, it is still a stupid film. It's his mother's name. It's his mother's name. 
Listen, if you have friends that tell you the Ultimate Edition makes it so much better, please show them this part so they can understand that they've been tricked by it being called the Ultimate. Let's get to it. Number 6. The plot of Batman vs Superman makes no goddamn sense. When I was watching this film, the first thing that annoyed me was this fuck and what he did. Why did this man stay on the floor? Why? Is he the captain of the ship? Is this a boat? Yeah! Hold on just a little bit longer. Wouldn't it have been a more dramatic moment if they were all in the elevator and despite their attempts to go down, they are still killed? Heavenly oh God, creator of heaven and earth. Do you get it yet? It's because of Jesus and God. Do you get it? Do you get it? It's deep, right? Do you get it? Why would being branded by the Batman be a death sentence in prison? Wouldn't it be something criminals be bragging about? Fuck, nigga! I stood toe to toe with the Batman and I'm still alive, motherfucker! Holy shit, me too, man, me too! They should form a club! Why would criminals do something the Batman wants, goddammit? This shit is in the original cut, in the extended edition. It turns out Lex Luthor hired someone to kill prisoner guy that got Clark Kent all mad. But this doesn't change the fact that Clark Kent is still a stupid fuck in both editions. Clark Kent just believe some anonymous tip in poorly written red ink. Oh yeah, I'll believe this, this anonymous tip. Yeah, sure, I, I won't look into it. And the premise of the argument is wrong. For this particular prisoner, if Batman did act as judge, jury, and executioner, this fuck wouldn't be in the prison. He'd be dead. Yup, totally Batman's fault. This anonymous tip is conveniently timed while I'm investigating the Batman. Yeah, I won't think about it. But what about the congressional hearings? What about the investigation behind it? This is the cornerstone of the conflict. The thing that spurs Batman on. The thing that makes Superman feel like a failure. The events leading up to the hearings should make sense. <laughs> as far as the theatrical cut is concerned, terrorist got shot. Therefore, Superman. Who would believe that Superman shot these people? The guy that can shoot lasers from his eyes? The extended edition shows they flamethrower that shit. So they framed Superman. That's all well and good. But then why didn't you show it in the theatrical cut? We call it the ultimate cut. Because it really, to me, it's the deeper dive. We didn't really take out much of the, you know, Superman Batman story because I felt like, you know, that's kind of the movie. Uh, but we, there was some a sort of like interstitial stuff that's around, that surrounds the story that kind of finishes some of the ideas. And it's a bad idea to start off your super serious, super smart film with most of the audience in the theater going, are they dumb? And then we're shown this stupid fuck. He answers to no one. Not even I think to God. And on her word alone, Congress believes her. They held hearings about what happened. I don't care what they're saying. The woman I love could have been blown up or shot. Think of what could have happened. Well, think about what did happen. Don't worry, Lois. I did. How about the fact that there's evidence that Superman didn't start shit? In the extended edition, we get these shots. There is smoke coming from the compound. So you got footage that the compound is already fucked up before Superman got there. But you're blaming it on Superman? And do you know why they have the footage in the first place? They were going to send a drone to bomb that shit. So you're mad at Superman because he killed the terrorists you were going to kill anyway? He even took the time to pile up the bodies. Wasn't that nice of him? I didn't kill those men if that's what they think, if that's what you're saying. Well, I'm saying I want to understand what happened. I'm saying thank you for saving my life. I'm saying there's a cost. If I was Superman, I'd be bothered too. Because Lois is acting like she wasn't there. I'm pretty sure she heard that! If the only thing that spurred this investigation on was this bitch saying, Superman caused shit, Lois Lane could just go, No, he didn't. Just tell her. Just go to the office and tell her. If this fuck could just show up, If this dumb bitch could just barge in, what is stopping Lois Lane? How do you make this make sense? Like Speaking of which, in the extended edition, we find out that she is just a pawn of Lex Luthor. And she confesses everything! And you know what they both do? This dumb bitch continues on with the hearing knowing that Superman has been set up! 
And you know, Lex Luthor acting like a smug motherfucker. Yeah, let's get on with the hearing. And this bitch leaves Congress. Even though she went there in the first place so that she wouldn't be in danger. But then she leaves so that she'll be in danger again. What the fuck? And then it doesn't matter if she left or not because Congress explodes anyway. So why didn't she just stay there? Whoever edited this shit should be shot. Because I could fix this. Just show the flamethrower scene. Then show her testimony. That's it! You don't have to show her ever again. We get that Lex set Superman up. That's all we need! What about Lois Lane? They involved her in what could possibly overthrow Lex Luthor's plot. She finds a bullet in her notebook. And in the course of her investigation, the bullet turns out to have been made by LexCorp. She has evidence, solid evidence. Aside from her hearing the bullets getting shot at. Why is it that Lois, in her most important role, in this part where she knows that Lex Luthor set Superman up, that Lex Luthor is behind something creepy and strange, she doesn't say anything. Oh, but she told Perry about the problem. No, oh, it needs to run now. Before the hearing, if Superman it might change what he said. I am not going to risk the paper so that you can pass notes in class to the man that rescued you. You don't need Barry to tell Superman. Bitch, he knew you were in trouble when you were in Africa. He's right there. You could probably shout, it's a trap. What's more annoying when you really think about it? You know, what I've been doing for the past three minutes or some shit. In a better story, her subplot would have a payoff. The investigative journalist solves the plot, uncovers the case. So was there any point in her investigation? <laughs> Do you know how much of an effect she has on the plot? At this point, fucking zero. You could cut out all her investigation scenes and just have her be in the Daily Planet. And it would still amount to the same ending. Congress blows up, Superman feels like shit, Batman gets angry. If the whole point was to show Lex Luthor was behind everything, you already did that. And actually, you shouldn't have. Because it shows that the only reason why Lex Luthor's plan worked was because everyone else was stupid. Deeper dive. And now they fight because that's the title of the film, right? I already talked about how their motivations against each other don't make sense. But then the film goes on to show that Superman can just handle this shit. What is stopping Superman from just carrying Batman to the atmosphere and telling him, we need to talk? How do you make this make sense? And they finish the fight in the most stupid way possible. Let's talk about Martha. Why did you say that name? You know what? Let's listen to what Zack Snyder thinks of Martha. It's canonical that they both have uh, mothers called Martha, but at what point did you realize? Were you looking for something that would turn Bruce around? 100% we were looking for some kind of connection, and, and um, that was uh, that was that seemed like an obvious way to humanize him when we took an obvious way to humanize him when we talked about the fact that they both have the mothers both have the same I'm here. first name, and, and the irony is for Bruce. The best ways to humanize Superman. We're in the cut footage. In the Ultimate Edition, you see Superman going out of his way to find the girl who testified. You see Superman calling his mother, asking her if he's doing the right thing. You see Superman at the ground level, caring about these people. You see Superman helping after Congress blows up. Without these scenes, Superman just looks like a whiny bitch who doesn't really want to help people. He's just burdened by it. But with these scenes, there's a context at least. You could say that he's glum all the time because he gives a fuck. This scene works because it's a character moment for Superman. He did save people during those montages, but that was not the point of Zack Snyder. The whole point of that scene for Zack Snyder was, Oh, there's a god amongst us. What do we do about the god? You're saying that their mothers having the same name is the best way for them to relate to each other? Listen to what he said. That was seemed like an obvious way to humanize him when we talked about the fact that they both have the mothers both have the same first name. And, and the irony is for Bruce in weakening Superman so far as to make him a man, mm -hmm. it makes the killing of a god impossible mm -hmm. because he's no he's been he, he's not a he's a he's just a man yeah. whose mother has the same name as he does. Yeah. So like all of his fervor and all of his heat has come off in the face of that you know mm. 
Absolutely. And now they're best friends who will do everything for each other, including saving his mother, which is not needed because he can do that in six seconds or some sh- Remember that this version of Batman said this. He has the power to wipe out the entire human race, and if we believe there's even a 1% chance that he is our enemy, we have to take it as an absolute certainty. Yeah, Bruce. Because his mother having the same name as yours means that it's now a 0% chance, doesn't it? How do you make this make sense? So the question now I pose, gentle listener, is this. For showing Superman giving a shit, but Batman still insisting that they fight. For giving Lois Lane knowledge of the plot, but being unable to do anything about it. For a senator to have knowledge that the person she's investigating has been framed, but still continues on with the investigation. Is the Ultimate Edition a better film than the theatrical cut? We call it the Ultimate Cut. Because it really, to me, it's the G per dive. Number seven, wrap up. If I look hard enough in Civil War, maybe I'll find a plot hole. But then I could just say, so what? This is a fun summer superhero movie. Very nice. But Batman vs. Superman wants to be taken seriously. Wants to feel realistic. You can't take it seriously because there are too many plot holes. You can't even say it's a superhero movie. Because the way these characters are handled, they're not really heroic. So you're left with a sloppy mess of a film. And then there's a trailer for Justice League that came out. But then I heard that Zack Snyder is still directing. And the truth is I'm a fan. And I really... Uh, I've... I've loved these characters pretty much my whole life and so getting an opportunity to put them in a movie together was not a thing I thought would happen um, you know other than just in my mind maybe come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination take a look and you'll see to your ima- imagination will begin with a spin Traveling in a world of my creation What we'll see Will defy Explanation If you want to view Paradise Simply look around and view it Anything you want to do it Want to change the world there No, I find no that compares with pure imagination. Living there, you'll be free if you truly want to. How do you make this make sense? That was a fun stinger. Wasn't that fun, you? You've got mail. What? Oh!